the paradigm shift to AI is as big as the shift to the internet. Welcome to the MMC Ventures podcast. We're going beyond the hype in artificial intelligence. A warm welcome to listeners. I'm David Kellner, partner and head of research at MMC Ventures, the insight-led venture capital firm based in London. In this six-part series, we'll be hearing deep insights from some of the world's leading AI technologists, entrepreneurs, and corporate executives, while keeping things accessible for the non-specialist. I think AI is today's most important enabling technology, but it's not easy to separate fact from fiction. My goal for this series is for us to come away better informed about the reality of AI today, what's to come, and how to take advantage. This series is sponsored by Barclays. I asked Barclays for a strapline they'd like to include as sponsor, and I thought their response was really interesting. Quote, thanks, but I'm not sure about slogans. Here's just how we think about AI. We think AI is incredibly important, a whole new field that's as significant as anything that's gone before. And we think about it a lot. We think AI is vital to our business and we're working hard to take advantage of it for our customers. And we need to learn from and collaborate with a wide range of people to ensure success. Technology advances fastest not when it's held close, but when people get out, listen and contribute. I thought that was better than any slogan, so I asked if we might run with that. I have pleasure in doing so. My guest today is Joseph Sarosh, PhD, Corporate Vice President of Microsoft Cloud AI Platform. It's a great privilege to speak with Joseph. Joseph leads Microsoft's enterprise AI strategy and Microsoft's cloud AI products, including the company's Azure machine learning, search and chatbot initiatives. I'm excited to talk with Joseph today about the implications of AI, the role of Microsoft's cloud AI platform and how it'll evolve in the future, the adoption of AI in the enterprise and more. Prior to his current role, Joseph was corporate vice president for Microsoft's data platform. And Joseph joined Microsoft from Amazon, where he was vice president for Amazon's global inventory platform. Joseph was responsible for the science and software behind Amazon's supply chain and order fulfillment systems, and Amazon's central machine learning group, which he built and led. Joseph holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Texas and has been a leader in the field of data science and machine learning since the 1990s. Joseph, a very warm welcome. Thank you for that introduction. Joseph, I'd like to start by thinking about the impact AI will have quite broadly. In a recent speech, you described the Cambrian acceleration, the time four billion years ago when organisms' ability to see, among other factors, enabled a radical expansion of organisms' capabilities and sophistication. You suggested that with AI, we're at a similar moment in software to that Cambrian acceleration. What do you expect to unfold in the decade ahead? It's a great question. Think about it this way. Until now, software was really about digitizing the world into bits and allowing programmers to write programs over them. With the power of AI now, for the very first time, you have the ability for computers to understand the data. Remember, you know, to see, for example, means to understand what's in the data, not just register bits in a pixels and pixels in a camera, for example. So AI is for the first time giving the computers the ability to understand what's in the digitized bits. Uh, and secondly, computers are going to be able to being uh, to act without being programmed. And that's a fundamental change on what computing itself is. And so until now, software was really simple and stupid. In the future, software is able to understand its data. It is intelligent, it's predictive, it's able to take action, it's able to help augment the human power in untold ways. That's the future that AI enables. And AI in many ways is going to become the new normal. Now, if I had said in the early 1990s that internet is going to become the new normal, a lot of people may not have really bought it. It feels like a very strong statement, but it happened at that time. And there were thousands of startups during the dot-com boom. And out of that, a whole number of startups survived and a tremendous transformation happened. The same is happening with AI today. There are thousands of startups and very large number of companies leveraging AI. AI is seeped into the fabric of everything we do on the mobile phone. And very soon it will be part of all software. And that's a new norm. Do you think AI is different from previous paradigm shifts in software that we've seen? The moves to mobile and cloud computing, for example, does the ability for software to learn through training now make it fundamentally different from previous paradigm shifts? It is absolutely as big, but I am not sure that it's fundamentally different because it's still software. Okay, AI is evolution of software and 
much as the term artificial intelligence leads one to think in human like forms it is far from that it is algorithms that are very mathematically describable it is statistical in nature it analyzes data it is not human intelligence at least not yet um, you know remember humans learn differently from machines humans are able to learn with one shot learning they are able to use context in ways that uh, otherwise are never possible computer software even with uh, artificial intelligence algorithms are not able to approach that uh, and I, you know i have a saying all artificial intelligence is dumb but some artificial intelligence is useful and you can create right. a lot of utility out of ai algorithms and that's a very powerful revolution in and of itself but it is evolution of software what will be the most significant implications of ai do you think i think there are incredible uh, possible uh, things that uh, ai can help with let me give some examples healthcare is an area where ai is going to be extremely revolutionary now we have a partner called epic software in uh, the us epic systems uh, they uh, build electronic medical record um, software uh, covers about 65% of the us population um, they have built an epic cognitive computing platform on microsoft cloud microsoft azure and they are enabling their customers which are hospital chains to analyze patient data and so some of the insights that people are able to find are amazing for example from uh, history in ele electronic medical record you can predict hypertension blood pressure up to 2 years in advance um, you can look at you know, the common workflows in a hospital for example that physicians and nurses follow and simplify that so dramatically you know for example when um, a physician treats a child with an earache he has to follow a very standard procedure which is very similar to what he follows with a lot of other patients and it's road work many times and you know uh, you know exactly what kind of tests he will prescribe and you might as well compress that workflow and make it all automated for the common cases so that you use very little of the physician's time for the simplest cases and take that precious time and apply it to the most involved most complex cases which truly needs attention it can lead to great optimizations in healthcare one more example in india we have a partnership with uh, an eye care institute uh, for uh, a variety of eye care related applications of ai for example we can actually using historical data estimate how a patient's eye heals after lasik surgery it turns out every patient heals differently and the final vision you may end up with after a surgery may be different in different people now you have before and after data and when you can actually apply machine learning you can actually accurately predict what a vision is going to be and when you can actually predict what a vision is going to be a month after healing you can correct for it ahead of the surgery so you can have perfect vision every time you do lasik surgery and that's powerful and so on and so forth so healthcare is rich with applications of machine learning um, assistive technology at the keynote today i'm going to be able to show a demo of in fact uh, one of my colleagues is actually blind visually impaired he has an application on a mobile phone that uses powerful cognitive services in microsoft's cloud and is able to help him scan documents recognize his environment recognize people and really assist him in performing in a complex world dramatically better than otherwise very very powerful so i think you will see ai seep into the fabric of our lives empowering us in every aspect of our life what's most misunderstood about ai today do you think i think it is the um sci-fi nature of ai it it couldn't be farther from the truth i think uh we tend to uh, see uh ai and computers and software in human like terms which it is not uh, by the way this reminds me of something uh, somebody uh, said which is uh, I, i forget who said you know i we will we should never be afraid of ai because ai does not have a survival instinct humans and life do and ai will never take over uh even if it becomes something that it's not today you know because it does never survival instinct um i really think ai is useful software first and foremost uh applied in the right way and microsoft um has espoused a set of principles for ai uh, the acronym for it is fate fair accountable transparent ethical and i think if we and by the way that applies to all technology and i think if we apply those principles fair accountable transparent and ethical to ai and we build uh, products the right way i think we have a 
a very powerful engine for the economy. Fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about Microsoft's cloud AI platform. Mm -hmm. um, your, your platform includes AI infrastructure and services and tools. Can you explain for corporate executives who are listening, entrepreneurs and investors, exactly what you provide and how using those can help people gain value from AI? Because it's not always very easy for people to kind of onboard to this ramp. Yeah, no, great question. Um, the way to think about it is, to apply AI, you have to build systems of intelligence. Uh, every company has to. Uh, systems uh, that help uh, process credit cards, process, uh, detect fraud, uh, interact with their customers, have conversations, uh, do marketing targeting, wherever AI is applied. Now, building the systems of intelligence is a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done in bringing the data together, applying it on a compute infrastructure, applying the algorithms, uh, creating uh, the web services, and then driving actions and taking feedback from it. Microsoft as a platform provider eliminates that heavy lifting. It creates uh, the platforms and the tools with which our developers, any developers, you know, corporate developers can easily assemble these systems of intelligence. So Microsoft is playing a role very similar to what it has always played in software. Um, in uh, earlier days, we provided operating systems. We provided uh, tools like the SQL Server database. We now have the Microsoft Cloud. These are our platforms that make the building of software applications dramatically easier. So we provide the Microsoft AI platform to make AI as easy to build for the common developer as possible and as easy for any company to get value out of as it has been now for a small group of extremely select companies, okay? A small group of extremely select companies have been able to build their own infrastructure for AI, have the data scientists, the advanced machine learning people, and the PhDs, and only they have been able to connect up all the components to make AI work. And now we are democratizing it, we are bringing it to everybody. Let's explore a bit how your machine learning services would evolve over time. You currently offer pre-trained machine learning services relating to computer vision, uh, written and spoken language, knowledge, and search. And as you described, developers can call on these services to deploy capabilities within their own projects. Will you be deepening existing capabilities in those, those areas or developing broader capabilities within those areas or, or both? It is both. It is both deepening and broadening. Now, uh, think about an example like speech or translation. It is incredibly hard for every company to start developing accurate speech recognition or accurate translation because it is not only about algorithms, it's also about the data. It's about expertise in speech as a domain or translation as a domain. So what Microsoft does is bring all of those things together the data, the expertise, and the software and algorithms together to create the best-in-class services for speech recognition or translation or search or language understanding or face detection or image understanding and so on and so forth. And that's pre-built AI for you, right? So that any developer can tap into that pre-built AI and infuse AI into their application without knowing AI. And so a big part of what we bring in uh, as a partner to companies is a broader collection of such pre-built components that make it possible to attach AI in all meaningful situations. And then in each of these areas, once that is already there, these are going to be continuously improving services. Speech services become more and more accurate over time. So you don't have to adopt a new technology just by subscribing to that service in the cloud your application constantly improves. Translation keeps on improving. Video understanding constantly. So you are now getting on a conveyor belt that is taking you towards the future along with our innovation as it continues. I can clearly see how the capabilities of each of those services will continue to evolve and deepen as you see over time. Can you give me some examples of how they might broaden? If you take an area like speech or uh, computer vision, can you give me a sense of the kinds of capabilities you might be able to deliver in years to come that you, you don't yes. deliver today? It's a, it's a great uh, question. So for example, in the case of speech, we have now a custom speech service that allows you to bring your vocabulary, so a banking vocabulary may be different from the vocabulary in another environment, 
your collection of accents, your domain information, so that it performs extremely well in those particular situations. When you take uh, translation, for example, you can do the same thing. Your custom vocabularies, all the languages you care about, and being able to be very accurate in those domains. Um, and this is going to be a key thing that we keep driving, customization with your own data to your own situation, and still not making you do the heavy lifting. To what extent will Microsoft want to develop sector-specific services or applications in AI? I mean, for example, object recognition that goes beyond recognition of everyday objects, or you alluded just now to uh, speech recognition that has vocabulary perhaps applicable to the financial services sector. To what extent do you want to yeah, tackle This is a great question. Articles? So um, in the cognitive services, customization is one step to helping people get there. But then there are specific areas like customer care where we can bring in tremendous amount of uh, components together to make customer care great. So for example, Microsoft in our own support center, we have deployed an AI-based conversational interface, a uh, conversational bot that has been able to uh, field approximately 30% of all the questions that come to it well, so that customers are self-serving and resolving it without escalating to a human agent. That is really big in the world of customer care. It is uh, much better for the customer because instant self-service resolution, it's very cost-effective for the call center. And again, like in the uh, situation I talked about in the case of doctors and hospitals, you're able to have your expert customer care agent spend time where that time needs to be spent. And that is very, very important. So we have the Microsoft Dynamics 365 solution for customer care, AI solution for customer care now. And that's some of the areas where we will bring specific intelligence. And then the rest of it, by the way, is really going to be through partners. Microsoft has always been a very partner-friendly company. That's our DNA, a platform company cherishes its partners. And our partners bring very often the domain expertise and the data to be able to create custom solutions in vertical industries. Fantastic. And do you, or to what extent, do you intend to expand into technological areas beyond vision, language, knowledge, and, and search? Uh, so it is a, a broad area, uh, AI, uh, that is. I want you to think about, think about, for example, the marketplace or an app store on a phone. There are millions of apps. In the same way, you should imagine a future where there are a million APIs in the cloud. It can be for speech and language and vision and any number of things. And the task of a software developer is then going to be about gluing together these APIs that are hosted in the cloud. APIs that are reliable, that never have an outage, that's backed up, that is uh, secure, that Microsoft stands behind, right? And Software development task is then by taking these prefabricated parts, customizable, assembling them together into an intelligent software application. And that is the future in many ways. Help me have a crystal ball here. What, what do you expect Microsoft's machine learning services to be able to do in, let's say, two years and in five years? If we're having this conversation in five years' time. So let's take examples. Uh, it's a very broad question. Let's take conversational bots, for example. Bots are becoming more and more useful. Now, um, my first caveat always applies. Artificial intelligence is always dumb, but some artificial intelligence can be useful. And bots are becoming very, very useful with AI for getting tasks done much faster than otherwise. I really believe there is a browser-like moment coming with a combination of bots and AI. You know, when the browser was first invented in the early days of the internet, although the internet existed, right? Inter internet evolved over 30 years. In hypertext protocol, HTTP existed since 1988. 92, when the browser came, the usability of the internet dramatically changed. And the same thing is happening now with bots and the power of AI to help understand conversations and get tasks done. And so one of the things I foresee in our future in two to five years is that you will have incredibly intelligent conversational bots in every enterprise. In fact, I'm going to be able to show one of them at Barclays, which took just all of 30 minutes to create. By scraping Barclays webpage, an intelligent bot was created that could answer questions. Um, and so imagine conversational interfaces taking over uh, as the primary ways 
that you interact with every service online, not through a web page, not through it. All web pages are designed for the PC era. Um, and conversational bots and AI is designed for the mobile intelligent era. And that's one of the big things that you would see. Fascinating. So you think language <coughs> interfaces represent the next paradigm shift in human computer interaction? Right. Natural language interfaces, but not just language, but AI that's able to understand your intent in your context, understand you, the history. So for example, let me give you a simple example. If I tell my Microsoft HR bot, I'm taking vacation tomorrow, I'll time off. It has to understand who I am as a Microsoft employee, salaried, vacation means eight hours. It has to go to the time and expense report application, invokes its API with tomorrow's date. It has to look up what tomorrow is. Then it has to go find and see if that field that of vacation, not sick leave, vacation, is actually filled already. If it is not filled already, put eight hours, reflect back to me and ask for my confirmation. That's a task completion workflow. I would have gone and done that over a PC or a web page. It would have taken many steps. It would have taken logins and all of those things. But a bot can complete that for me. And I think that's how bots become really useful. And talking of chatbots, in the home, digital assistants will, I think, clearly continue to grow in capability and in ubiquity. Now, Amazon, Google, and Apple are all releasing their own in-home smart speakers with embedded voice control assistants. Microsoft's embedding its AI assistant, Cortana, in to the Xbox and some third-party devices. Yeah. And the Harman Kardon um, invokes people. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but isn't producing its own device. Does your strategic approach to assistants in the home differ from other companies? Well, so I think we will continue to invest in virtual assistants, both Cortana on Windows and you know, Cortana in these other devices. Um, they are one of the dimensions that is exciting, but not the only one. Uh, we uh, are going to see conversational bots everywhere. Um, for example, Unilever has created a Unibot. There's a meta bot that then uh, federates to a lot of sub bots for specialized tasks. It can be HR or it can be um, in a servicing or many of those things. So you're actually going to see companies create federations of bots even that actually uh, complete uh, tasks uh, and certain bots are skilled in certain things and so on. And then one of the other things uh, I should add also, bots are in many ways sort of quote unquote front office. I believe the vast majority of AI will be invisible AI. Machine in, to machine AI. Uh, correct. Invisible AI that is in the fabric of the economy, helping prevent fraud in payment systems helping behind the scenes with health healthcare, um, uh, do uh, targeted marketing and ad targeting, um, and essentially helping regulate the entire fabric of the economy. And you're not going to be directly interacting with it. Uh, it's going to make us safer by doing predictive maintenance. It is going to help uh, electricity utilities and telephone utilities optimize their networks, and so on and so forth. Vast amount of AI, it's sort of like the uh, iceberg. 90% of AI will be invisible AI in the fabric of our economy, making our economy dramatically more efficient. Fantastic. Um, let's talk a bit about AI company strategies. You, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but strategically, what does Microsoft aim to achieve in the long term through the provision of cloud AI infrastructure and services and the open sourcing of AI frameworks and libraries like Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit? Is your goal to democratize AI and then monetize the infrastructure and services at the heart of this paradigm shift? Or do you think about it a little, little differently to that? Well, uh, Microsoft is first and foremost a software and a technology company. And we are a platform provider. Our strategy is build the next intelligent cloud, intelligent edge platform and the productivity tools. So longer term, our strategy will continue to be along that direction, which is provide the best in class services on the intelligent edge and the intelligent cloud for, uh, for both software development and for productivity and empowering everyone. It's a broad charter. If we think about paradigm shifts that occur in software, in what ways, if any, do you think the paradigm shift to AI will be different from the shifts that we've seen recently to cloud and mobile computing? I think the paradigm shift to AI is as big as the shift to the internet, which means, like, for as I said, for the first time, computers are not going to have to be programmed for a whole collection of tasks. And they're going to be able to learn from its data. 
And I think what you will see is very rapidly um, ambient intelligence coming in. You know, everything around you, every device, every uh, software, um, you know, even the lighting in your room, all of that will be able to uh, use data to be better. And the environment uh, that you work, uh, you know, humans shape their environment. And AI will be the agent that humans use to adapt the environment or the planet. For at least 50 years, technology has accelerated cycles of creative destruction and has reduced the length of time for which large companies tend to maintain value. I wonder, though, whether we might see a, a bifurcation going forward in companies' longevity and the emergence of a small number of super competitors in the technology sector who capture and maintain value to a greater extent than has been the case in the past. And they might emerge because of data network effects in AI, um, because technology companies are expanding horizontally, more imaginatively into uh, emerging technologies like quantum computing. Um, and finally, because technology companies are expanding more for, uh, excuse me, forcefully up and down the technology stack as well. Um, for example, technology companies developing their own silicon. Do you think some super competitors might emerge? Or do you think ultimately this cycle will be pretty similar to others? Uh, I think you said that in the uh, beginning itself, that uh, the longevities of companies are um, and half-lives of companies are constantly decreasing. I think as if you have a civilized society, if you have uh, a fair education system, you have fair healthcare and uh, uh, an economy that is uh, properly regulated by by a democratic government. I think we will uh, um, we will be insulated no matter what technology comes in. I think we will have fair competition. We will have incredible creative destruction. I think the world will be a better place. And it's not really about technology. It's really about how we govern ourselves. Uh, and I think AI as uh, gives governments as well a lot of ability to create fair, powerful infrastructure and systems. There are cities tapping into AI for city next projects and making citizens better empowered and healthier and so on and so forth. Now, that said, one of the things that we have seen in the world in general is in pretty much every sector of the economy, there are a small number of dominant players, whether it be in banking, in oil or in uh, metallurgy or iron ores, uh, uh, any of those areas that are a small number of players. That is part of what the network effect generally is, which is um, the winners tend to be able to capture economies of scale that allow them to, for a period of time, while that particular sector is still hot, achieve a dominant position. I think you will see that in the world of software, cloud, and AI. Uh, but it, I do see those things as being transient. Right, there isn't something uniquely different. And special I don't think there is anything the uniquely Microsoft different. Every sector, uh, yeah, in sectors of the economy itself uh, are dynamic, and some sectors are hot at one period of time because of structural factors, and they change. Microsoft itself was challenged by previous, uh, excuse me, previous paradigm shifts to, to mobile and cloud computing, but today Microsoft really has become a, a leader in cloud computing and the next paradigm shift of, of AI. I'm curious to ask, from an insider's point of view, what did you see that were the keys to turning around a company the size and complexity of Microsoft? I think uh, really it is a, a company is an organism, and the right leadership makes a huge difference. I think having the right culture. Um, at the end of the day, look, we are all knowledge workers. What matters the most is creativity. What matters the most is being able to create value for customers. Uh, so creating a customer-centric culture, uh, focusing on unleashing the creativity of the employees that were already there, ensuring we are great partners, ensuring that we are open, that we are a learning company, putting all of those things in place, which our leadership was able to do very effectively. I think that is what helped us become competitive again. And uh, those are fundamental principles. In many ways, uh, while we talk about platforms, there is also a concept of a management platform that you have to think about a platform that has the right ingredients in terms of management structures, culture, orientation, and so on, that no matter what changes, allows you to innovate and stay competitive and create new products and services of high value in many, many, many areas. And that's what some of the leading companies like Microsoft have been able to do. We're still very early in the paradigm shift to AI. 
But what do you think is the biggest disruptor beyond AI? What's the biggest opportunity and threat, do you think, to Microsoft in 10 years' time? <laughs> One of the areas that we have been pursuing very aggressively uh, in a, a scientific uh, uh, endeavor is quantum computing. I think, imagine computers that are able to solve problems that classical computers will take a billion years to solve. And um, it does not, at this point in time, give, uh, with the state of the technology, look too far, uh, far away. Maybe five to 10 years when that is real. And it's not just Microsoft. There are multiple companies uh, working in the area of quantum computing. We uh, believe we have a scientific advantage and a technological advantage at this point in time with some of the innovations we made. And then realizing that in practice, will change the face of software and computing yet again. And uh, machine learning will and AI will become different again. Um, in fact, life itself wouldn't exist in the classical physics, right? At, uh, for example, certain phenomena like photosynthesis are believed to be quantum mechanical, not just traditional chemistry. In the same way, certain types of computation and AI will be quantum mechanical in nature. Uh, certain things that can be done will be possible only with quantum computers. That will be an exciting future to look to. We can do another podcast then. Yes, um, absolutely. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about adoption of AI within the enterprise today. Um, to what extent do CEOs or CTOs understand AI today? Well, uh, let me say it this way. At no other time in history have so many people understood so little about so much. <laughs> and that is true, not just about AI, but about computing and our own lives itself. We, our lives were much simpler when we were younger. And so all of these technology waves um, come so fast. There is a dire need for companies like Microsoft that reduce these things to pre-built AI or recipes you can follow without having to understand it in depth. We take it for granted that we actually don't understand what a CPU is or how your mobile phone works or what the connectivity is. I mean, we say Wi-Fi, but we don't understand what Wi-Fi is. We don't have to. We shouldn't have to. Uh, we, uh, that's how technology is, uh, and civilization itself is built. Um, there are specialized uh, people who build the components for civilized economies. There will be lots of specialized component makers for AI. You should be able to use those and build higher order value. If we envisage a classic adoption curve of innovators, early adopters, the early mainstream, the late mainstream, and, and laggards. Where are we today within the enterprise around AI? So there are a few companies that get it really well. Uh, if you look at uh, the top five market cap companies in the world, they are all uh, building at the intersection of three of the most important trends in computing, cloud, data, and artificial intelligence. All of their software is at the corner of that cube defined by cloud, data, and intelligence, the axis of the three. Um, so a significant number of the top companies have uh, used AI in some way or the other, perhaps classical AI, uh, but the rest of those companies are soon going to follow. Uh, and we are early in the adoption life cycle. Uh, we are very much in the, uh, for a lot of AI, at the middle maybe, or the early part of crossing the chasm. From a practical perspective, what next steps would you recommend to enterprise executives that recognize AI could be important, or could be valuable, but aren't sure how to embrace the technology? What should they do next? I think like any of these other technologies, uh, you should avoid the tendency to dismiss these things offhand. Very often you see a lot of companies being or rushing to be fifth in line. And rushing to be fifth in line means you absolutely miss the advantages or the virtuous flywheel it will kick off and uh, the person who got their first or second in line is going to have a dominant advantage in your industry that is what technologies do technologies create winner take all effects now, it is incredibly important for folks uh, for everyone to lean into these disruptions and um, understand in their domain what are the likely areas which are likely to have the highest roi only if ai could do something for you and then go see if you can make that happen. You need to experiment. And today, every company has to be a learning, experimenting company. And today, you have to experiment with AI. It is the technology wave that is today real. Uh, and the top companies in the world have shown how AI gives them 
incredible advantages and create new products and new experiences. According to a Gartner survey, <clears throat> lack of skills within organizations is the greatest impediment to adoption of, of AI. How can companies address that issue? I think by using pre-built parts. I think using uh, um, recipes. Um, I think using cloud is another one, by the way. Um, cloud is the greatest invention um, since um, the invention of the steam engine. It uh, simplifies software, um, uh, like uh, steam engine, which uh, eliminated the need for a horse and buggy. Uh, it is removing the barriers to building and deploying entire applications because the cloud provides um, the, you know, the cloud turns hardware into software. You never have to buy and provision hardware and have physical data center space and networking and wiring and all of those things. It changed the game. Uh, the cloud turns software into services. You don't, don't license and install software. It just comes to you as a service. Leveraging all of that agility that the cloud provides you is incredibly important for you to be able to compete. And I think leveraging the cloud, leveraging the pre-built parts available in the cloud, and then building the applications on top of that is going to be incredibly important for you to have the short turnaround and experiment extremely rapidly. And in many ways, your success as a company, any company, is going to be dependent upon the number of experiments you can run. And that's the key uh, uh, that you have to realize. I can I ask you briefly about LinkedIn? So last year, Microsoft bought LinkedIn for uh, $26 billion. And LinkedIn obviously offers a variety of assets, including its professional user base, the content that people post on it, its information regarding people's expertise and employment history and influences and contacts. To what extent, if any, was LinkedIn a, a data play to support Microsoft's AI ambitions as opposed to more its goals in, say, customer relationship management software? To, to what extent is LinkedIn a source of data for Microsoft's broader AI strategy, or is that just a happy side effect? So LinkedIn has a very trusted relationship with its users. We have a user agreement that permits only certain uses of the data. It is in the interest of the LinkedIn members. And we hold at Microsoft and at LinkedIn that user trust as the number one thing. Because if our users don't trust us and if they are not getting the value first, we are actually not going to be able to uh, have any asset over there at all. And so I think this uh, is one of the things that Microsoft in general uh, holds as opposed to certain competitors. Um, who, you know, certain of our competitors you, uh, explicitly say they will use that data because their monetization is from an ad business or one of those other things. Um, that is not Microsoft's uh, primary policy. So um, LinkedIn is an incredible asset that uh, helps serve its members first and foremost. And where uh, that, uh, that member group gives us permission uh, to use it primarily in their interest, that's where we start. How, though, with users' permission, do you think you can derive value from their data? Is that an AI play? Let's say you have an Office 365 subscription. And in, in say, let's say Barclays has an Office 365 subscription. And you have all of the employees in uh, Barclays. It's potentially very um, helpful for you to see associated with each of those employees their uh, LinkedIn profile. Uh, so you know exactly what you, uh, you know, Anyway, people do look uh, LinkedIn profiles up as uh, you know, business cards. So being able to connect all of that information, help foster uh, social networks in the workplace, being able to help improve employees' work lives. There are a lot of applications like that for LinkedIn. Let's talk a bit about AI technology. What do you see as the greatest limitations and challenges in AI technology today? I think... Uh, Technologically, we still have a long way to go in uh, learning like human beings. Human beings learn instantly. They can follow directions. Um, machine learning and AI today looks, requires a lot of specific data to be able to learn. And it's not just data, data about the specific thing you want to learn with the labels and so on. I think this limitation is, uh, is, is a huge one. Uh, so, you know, while we are been talking about all the magic of AI, it has still been hard to even create a two-legged walking robot that can navigate every environment. I can't create a robot that will get me uh, my lunch or get me a coffee. Um, it is still very hard to do. So I think there is that, again, I will keep going back to my uh, original statement. You have to keep it simple and structured. And all AI is dumb, but some AI is useful. 
So you've got to tailor to the area where AI is really useful. And uh, uh, it is not uh, AI, it's not general human intelligence where uh, you can apply to every problem. And that is still the primary challenge around AI. So it's, it's interesting. We're often reminded that training data is critical for AI, that training data is the new oil and so on. And clearly good quality training data is extremely valuable. But, but I feel, and it, it sounds like you're describing there, that perhaps the value of proprietary algorithms is understated. In some areas like processing language, lack of data isn't the issue. It's actually the algorithms we have. And do you think, in other words, there could be a new wave of capability made possible by new algorithms that enable us to do useful things with less training data? Correct. There is a tremendous amount of innovation happening with new algorithms, but it is not only with new algorithms, it is also capabilities such as what is called transfer learning, meaning learn in a related domain where there is the right data available and carry over that learning to adjacent domains. Um, and so if you uh, have great data in translating from English to French, can you then now make it much easier to translate from English to Spanish or English to some other language, right? And I think that kind of transfer learning is actually very powerful. So new algorithms will definitely help. Uh, and also remember, uh, when it comes to data, it is the right data that matters. A small number of bits of right data is dramatically more useful than petabytes of useless data. And sometimes people over-index on the value of data. Uh, and people say, hey, data is the new oil. Uh, in my mind, data is not the new oil. Data is the new noise. Uh, and big data is big noise. It's only the right data um, married to the specific problem that you need to uh, uh, solve for. And the right framing of the problem all coming together that allows uh, the right AI to be built. You alluded to the problem of transfer knowledge there and transferability. <laughs> Do you think we can realistically expect a lot of progress there in the medium term, or do you think transferability will remain really quite limited over the next sort of three to four years? I think in the specific domains like speech, language, uh, uh, vision, and so on, transfer learning will be very powerful. I think it's already turning out to be very, very powerful. Uh, I think in any new domain, there is a, a cold start problem. Initially, you have to go gather the data and the labels and frame the problem and solve it once. And once a particular problem is solved, it becomes much easier to transfer that ability. Explainability of deep learning algorithms, obviously, and, and well understood difficulty. In many cases, we, we know that deep learning algorithms work well, but we, we just can't look inside to see the basis for their recommendations. Do you expect, expect excuse me, this explainability challenge to be addressed anytime soon? I think explainability is a challenge for all complex systems. It's not unique to AI. We can't explain most of the things that we interact with. We can't explain human judgment or even corporate behavior uh, many times. There's an illusion of explainability uh, very often. And that is true. And uh, I think uh, AI will be challenged in terms of explaining. But here is what it will be possible. It will be testable. Uh, and I think this is an important difference. Look, um, most of uh, medicines in today's world they're not explainable. You don't know exactly the specific processes by which the vast majority of medicines that you consume work and are effective. However, when we launch a new drug, we go through randomized clinical trials. We have a very specific process for qualifying the drug for human use. We have a regulatory authority that looks at it. In areas where uh, AI directly impacts human life in meaningful ways, where we care about uh, many of those things in particular, I think we will have similar um, similar structures, similar regulations, similar guidance. And that's what will help regulate complex technology, period. Um, and uh, what I think uh, we can do is use those principles of statistics to create frameworks for testing AI applications that provide a high level of transparency into why certain things work the way they do. And that is, uh, in my mind, the right direction to go scientifically. So quite a, I guess, sort of philosophers would call it a kind of instrumentalist approach. You know, software is a tool. We, if it acts in the way we think it will act and it does so in a predictable way and it's useful, that's kind of enough. And your point is that that's, um, that's the way most of our tools work today as it is. No and different. that's how most software is. Yeah. Software is not provable. And there have been attempts in the world of software to create uh, provability for software. It's not provable. It's tested. 
it's debugged, it's tested, it's continuously maintained, it's continuously improved. And that will be the case with AI. AI is software at the end of the day. Just finally on AI technology, while recent advances in computer vision have been really striking, AI's ability to understand language is still, in reality, I think, very limited. We can transcribe and translate speech really well, but our ability to derive meaning from information and solicit related information, I think, is quite limited. Put another way, my Amazon Alexa can understand me it, you know, it, it can transcribe my speech very well, but it can't actually perform many functions. To what extent do you think this will change? I mean, how long will it take before I can ask quite a broad question and get some, uh, some specific full answers, do you think? I think these services will be rapidly improving. Uh, the nature of most of these services is a sort of uh, constantly collecting more information, more data, Algorithms are improving. I think uh, in specific task areas, uh, I think they will become extremely good and useful. However, again, uh, it will never give you the appearance of being truly capable like a human being. Uh, Again, I don't think aspiring to that is necessarily worth it. Uh, That I think in each of these areas, uh, it's a matter of a small number of years before these uh, become extremely useful. Great. Um, I'd like to finish just by raising two points about social impact uh, of AI. The potential benefits of AI, I think, are, are numerous and fairly well understood. I think we're all really excited about better healthcare, cheaper transportation, enhanced manufacturing, and increased agricultural output. But I'd like to discuss just a couple of societal risks. Regarding job displacement, do you think AI might destroy more jobs than it creates? I think. Uh, uh Every technology revolution, starting from the Luddites, have feared that that, uh, technology destroys jobs. What technology actually does is it changes jobs. In the economy, it changes what's called the production possibility frontier, one of the foundational curves in economics that you learn, which is fundamentally change what the economy is capable of producing and creates incredible efficiencies. So as a result, in my opinion, what is going to be uh, uh, happening is the 7 billion people on the planet are going to find new economic opportunity because the productive capacity of the economy is so much more enhanced. And therefore, uh, back to good governance, if you have great democratic governments, which are really at the end of the day governments for the people, Uh, The governments are going to be able to create economic opportunity for all that actually makes the world a better place. And then it's really about how we govern ourselves and less about the technology itself. Do you think it might be different this time if this technology is enabling us to automate some uh, more repetitive tasks? But that automation is power, right? It allows you, it amplifies human power. Automation augments you. Automation allows you to take that time and creativity and the nerve cells which you only have. And, you know, by the way, no AI is creative. AI Creativity is not what AI is born with. And so it allows you to tap into that creativity and uh, uh, instead of being um, engrossed in drudgery and tasks that have low economic value, create new economic value. And so I am very optimistic about it. Let's talk about bias. Uh, AI has the potential, I think rather excitingly, to free decision-making from human biases by making better, more objective decisions. But AI algorithms, of course, are trained on historic data sets that reflect historic prejudices we have, particularly regarding race and gender. How can we prevent AI reinforcing historical biases? By testing. Uh, The answer is by testing. Uh, Just like uh, uh, the medical analogy, when you develop a new drug, you are going to take it through a a collection of steps to validate that particular drug. Randomized clinical trials are, for example, the standard in drug testing. Um, The same way where AI um, really impacts human uh, lives and decision-making, it has to be tested, it has to be debugged. Uh, You have to have the testing framework for it. And I think that's part of the technology that uh, uh, we all have to develop together. So effectively good governance frameworks for good QA. And even scientific principles for testing. Right. Statistics has a very sound um, uh, a methodology for testing uh, statistical systems and black box systems and so on. And I think those are, uh, technologies all apply. 
I'll finish with just a quick fire round, if I may. Uh, six questions, maybe just sort of one to two word answers for each. Um, firstly, is the promise of AI overhyped? It's now uh, in the plateau of reality. In which sector will AI have the most profound impact? On internet businesses. Do you think AI will destroy more jobs than it creates? No. Should we worry a lot about autonomous weapon systems? No. Will we achieve the AI singularity where general AI triggers a period of unprecedented technological change? And if Not so, in my lifetime. And finally, should AI systems of sufficient intelligence have rights? The sufficient intelligence is going to be so far beyond what I can imagine that uh, I don't think that'll be a problem we face. Chisa, this has been a great pleasure. Thanks for your expertise Thank you and insight. Much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of MMC Ventures Beyond the Hype podcast, presented in association with Barclays. Follow us on Twitter at MMC underscore ventures and explore our research at mmcventures.com. Don't miss our next episode, Healing Healthcare, where leading entrepreneur Ali Parsa describes how AI will transform the delivery of healthcare worldwide. Healthcare is broken, but it can be democratized.